Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 258 of Stand Up. Joining me today, anthropologist and author, Professor Richard Grinker. My name is Pete Dominic. Time to stand up with me right now. Hello and welcome to a semi-vacation week of programming. What does that mean? Well, every episode has new guests, great conversations, the same high-quality, brilliant folks you have grown to expect from me here on Stand Up. But I just won't be doing all of the extras around it for two reasons. One, it takes hours every day to produce a more thorough podcast with separate news segments. And two, I'm trying to take my mind off the news and invest it into my family and liberating some of the difficult issues I've been dealing with throughout the past year. Things are going really well for me, but when you focus so much on work, which is what I've been doing, and specifically on the news and the world around us, which is what I do every day, and I'm not complaining about it, but you tend to lose a little bit of balance. So this is the end of the year and a week I'm trying to invest in my girls and my wife and putting out some minor some minor fires and some issues in the home so that they don't become more major fires and bigger issues because I've been neglecting them for working so hard. So it's a semi-working vacation, new content every day. Excited to share with you my conversation with anthropologist Roy Richard Grinker, his new book, Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. That is coming up, but I also want to remind you here on Taint Week, the final week of December, to make sure to get your donations into GiveWell. Go to GiveWell.org slash stand up. They're my partner. They're my sponsor. And I've really, really enjoy working with them. So many of you have donated, but if you haven't yet, please do. And everything up to $250 will be matched. If you're a first time donor, they do tremendous amount of research on the organizations that make your dollar go the furthest, go to givewell.org slash stand up and see the organizations that they have endorsed and help improve and save more lives. Givewell.org slash stand up. Thursday night is New Year's. I will be doing uh, hosting a hangout. Not exactly sure the details, the arrangements. If anybody has ideas on how to make it more fun, let me know. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. And if you aren't a paid subscriber to the Stand Up community, we would love to have you. You get to join us in all the hangouts as well as the Discord platform 24 7 and direct access to me to tell me what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, who you'd like to hear on the podcast. So go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or go to the paid subscription link in the show notes and do that now. Okay, so like I said, I'm tr- trying not to pay attention to the news. I know there's an argument about whether or not the guy who blew up his RV is a terrorist, but right now I'm focused on the biggest problem I saw today, which is there were too many people at the ski resort and uh, they're, some of them are not good enough to be carrying a speaker playing music in their backpack. If you don't know how to ski or snowboard well, then you don't get to carry around a speaker playing music. To me, that was the thing that upset me the most today because I've tried my best to turn off the news. All right, so let me tell you about my first and only guest for today's episode He is a professor of anthropology and international affairs at George Washington University. He's the author of several books, including Unstrange Minds, Remapping the World of Autism. And I just, I really enjoyed reading and enjoying reading his book. And this conversation I'm very happy with. And it's about stigma. It's about mental illness and the way that different cultures see it. For centuries, scientists and society cast moral judgments on anyone deemed mentally ill. The book jacket reads, combining many to asylums. And nobody's normal anthropologist, Roy Richard Grinker, chronicles the progress and setbacks in the struggle against mental illness stigma from the 18th century through America's major wars and into today's high tech economy. Huh? Are you sold? I certainly was on that paragraph alone, which is why I was so excited to have this conversation with Dr. Grinker. And finally, one note my audio in this episode is not its normal high quality. Long story. I think you can tolerate it just fine. It's mostly him talking, so hopefully it's not a problem. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Grinker. The book is Nobody's Normal. Here we go. 
All right, here he is joining me now. I'm so excited to have him, Dr. Roy Richard Grinker, but you just go by by Richard. Is that right, sir? That's right. Call me Richard. Well, I am so excited to have you. It's very, do you, can you imagine that it might be intimidating for someone like me to interview a man who has done uh, so much work in his life and has been all over the world to do that work and has written all of these books like Perspectives on Africa, a reader in culture, history, and representation, where you're the co-editor of that. Unstrange Minds, Remapping the World of Autism. Recently, uh, you wrote Houses in the Rainforest, Ethnicity and Inequality Among Farmers and Foragers in Central Africa. Sir, who are you? How have you done all of this work? And how can I possibly be in a conversation with you, given all of this experience? Well, no one's ever asked me that question. I, maybe we should. Maybe you're just not worthy you know what? You're right. Let's wrap it up. Thank you for joining me. Uh, go get the book, everybody. <laughs> you know, I was raised in a family that really valued scholarship yeah. and incredibly hard work. And uh, I also was raised in a family that wasn't perfectionist. So, you know, I was raised to think that once I had a rough draft, show it to a lot of people. It doesn't matter that it's not perfect. It can always get better. And to work collaboratively, and and I think that I've I've really benefited from that. Um, not being embarrassed to give somebody uh, a paragraph or two that uh, you know is lousy, as long as they have the relationship with me where they can say, "Richard, it's lousy." I like that, and I admire that. I'm not sure when you learned the phrase, "Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good," but it was like three years ago for me. But uh, nonetheless. All that hard work and, and being raised in that family and let, yet you still let your family down by not following in their footsteps. Um, so how did you fail and, and how do you feel about it? Well, yeah, you know, my, my great grandfather was a, a psychiatrist, such as they were, you know, in the late 1800s. My grandfather was a psychiatrist. My father was a psychiatrist. I married a psychiatrist. It's been this kind of legacy in my life that I, you know, just kept pushing away because I kind of idolized, especially my grandfather, because he wrote so many articles and books, all in pencil, by the way. And, and yeah, and then he would get somebody, you know, hired a typist or something, you know. Pencil. And, and I was just so in awe of him. And I think I decided not to go into psychiatry because I just didn't want to compete. You know, I didn't want to be not as good as he was, you know. Uh, that's really interesting. He also apparently lived right across the street and he was this guy. I mean, that, what a what a strange, uh, I'll go ahead and say abnormal and you'll punish me, uh, childhood, because you come from this academic household where your father and your grandfather and his grandfather, his father are all psychiatrists. And I just can't imagine what kind of a person you are and uh, given your 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 knowledge base and what kind of a kid you were living around all of these people who had been basically trying to map the brain and understand it all. Well, you know, it had its pluses and its minuses. Um, by the time I was in sixth grade, I thought I could analyze my classmates' dreams. You know, I'd go into school and I'd say, hey, tell me your dream. Tell me your dream. Oh. I, remember, I remember there was this one kid. I didn't remember his name. I have no idea what became of him, John Blaha. And he, and he came up and he said, hey, Grinker, Grinker, I've got a a dream for you. And it was about, I remember like a, a tall red haired bear that's attacking him and he outsmarts the bear. And uh, I said, Oh, that's a dream about your father. Cause your dad's got red hair. So it's a dream about being, you know, afraid of your dad and outsmarting your dad. And he said, well, the joke's on you, Grinker, cause I made it up. I did. It's not even my dream. I just made it up. And I turned to him and I remember I said, yeah, you made it up. It came out of your mind. And later that night, when my mom noticed the bruise on my arm, <laughs> she didn't punch me. Hey, she Grinker, promised. come tell me what my dream means. <laughs> Beat the hell out of poor little Richie Grinker. Oh, wow. It that's a me never to analyze people's dreams anymore. But I was actually surprised by how many people wanted to tell me. I'm sixth grade, seventh grade. Mm. Who, you know, why are these people going to want to tell me a dream? Because it felt good to them to talk about a dream. Even at that young age, you know, I could have got I got this sense that talking about, you know, the things that are difficult in your life, uh, whether it's a dream or something else, 
has a really positive impact if you've got somebody who wants to listen. At some point, I'd love to talk with you about, you know, where, where gender plays in, but I, I didn't get to that part in your book or I'm not sure yeah. I covered that. Well, but. you know, if I can, if I can continue, you know, with this time period of sixth, seventh grade, as I went on, um, I remember in high school, I got a job as a, um, just filing at a psychiatric hospital. My grandfather arranged it for me and I bumped into one of my classmates and she was a patient and uh, she, you know, I never saw her files, but I, she was emaciated. I, I think she probably had anorexia nervosa and it created such a stir with so many telephone calls from principals and parents to keep this quiet that nobody could know that she was in a psychiatric unit really impressed upon me at that time, what stigma was even at that early age, I could, I could see that stigma and imagining you know, what she was dealing with on top of the illness, she had to deal with what people thought about the illness, what moral judgment they might have. It's terrible. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you stayed with that time period because I read that part in your book, that that story, and it, it is terrible and so much has changed. And so before we really get too far into it, I do, do want to make sure everybody understands that our conversation will be, as your book is, uplifting. Can you give us a preview of uh, so why this book is inspiring and uplifting? Well, I think Nobody's Normal is, first of all, the title, I think, is uplifting because it's like, a it's great, know, title. great title. <laughs> Normal and abnormal are these imaginary places that nobody actually lives in, yeah. um, but we've created them and they, they can do more harm than good. Um, but, you know, I, as a professor in particular, really see changes in my students. Um, I see that they're talk. they're, you know, 20 years old, 21 years old. Some of them are 18 and they start to talk about their mental illnesses in ways that are just really um, quite comfortable. I remember the first time it really impressed me was a kid was in my class and he came up to me after class and said, professor, you may have noticed that I was doing crossword puzzles um, during class. I want you to know that I'm not uh, ignoring the class and paying attention, but I have autism and I've learned that if I have a crossword puzzle and I look at it, I can focus better and I can process the information and hear it. And I probably won't make eye contact with you, but I'm listening. I just want you to know. And I remember my thought was, who the hell taught that kid? Where did this happen that he was in some school or some family that prepared him to advocate for himself and to explain about his needs and his strengths and his challenges with such openness? And it was just, it was amazing. And then remember the se- and then the second was when the LA Lakers won the championships this year. No, not this year. Uh, oh, right. and it was, yeah, go ahead. I don't remember when it was, like 2007, maybe. 2000, it was a long time ago. And Ron Artest was being interviewed. And he was just, you know, exalting in the victory, of course. And he said, I want to thank my teammates and my family and my psychiatrist. And that was the moment where you said, basically... Where you observe uh, culture changing in that you can out loud say... I see a psychiatrist. I seek help to, to, right? That's what you mean? Exactly. That you can say it, you can be open, and it's not going to somehow um, label you as deficient or weak or, you know, we're not that many decades away from the time when John F. Kennedy's sister had a lobotomy, ruined, devastated her her life, Uh, famous Scientists, if they had children with Down syndrome or an intellectual disability, um, shuttled them off to institutions. Women but were told bullied. people, but you missed the most important detail because I just read that part in your book. Shuttled them if you had a who was it that the scientist had a child uh, born Down syndrome and Eric he Erickson whisked Eric Erickson whisked her away to a facility and told everybody that his child was still born and died. Yeah. And the siblings didn't find out about the fact that they had a brother, Neil, until Neil died. No, they never met him. Yeah. Oh, that's so crazy. And then you mentioned also James Forrestal, who I knew only because I feel like uh, there's like a, 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 a carrier named after him or even a. There uh, is. Yeah. And he was the first, I guess, Secretary of War or in, in World War Two. 
Um, you're, the, the history buffs will know that better than me. Yeah. He was very, very famous, but he was so depressed and seriously depressed. And they treated him with kid gloves because they said, you know, here's a guy who's a major political figure. He can't have depression. So they called it exhaustion. And he wasn't really carefully monitored and he committed suicide. I mean, those were those were days when and it's not that far away. And I just had to write this book to say, where did that come from? That shame and that secrecy. And, and, and how did we get to this place now where my students are being so open about it and athletes and celebrities are being open about their struggles with mental illness? How did we get to this place? And if we can figure it out, maybe we can stay the course because the whole history of the stigma of mental illness is really an up and down thing. One step forward, one step back, one step forward, one step back. And we need to keep it going. Yeah, we, we do. And that's why it is an inspiring and uplifting book. So, so my next question is, I thought it was so important. This is one line. I, I, I get emotional reading your book because it, it, it put so much of what I, I thought or, or had assumptions into words and helped me understand so much, certainly about history and about the present. And then in my own family, I'm thinking of two family members uh, of mine you know, when, I, when I ask you about this. But you write that something to the extent of there's never been or there is no vocabulary for mental illness. And then you go on to define all kinds of words and, and, and talk about how you use words and so on. I think that matters, for example, mental illness versus mental disorder. But my point here, I think the most important one is, as you're talking about the past and you say things like exhaustion, people just didn't have the words. We didn't know what to say. We didn't know what was wrong with us. We didn't know what was wrong with our loved ones. And even when the experts told us, it's still, obviously, we have a lot to learn. We still do. How important is just understanding and having some it, even limited vocabulary to describe what's happening inside of me and me or my loved ones? It's so crucial to have words that don't um, that don't stigmatize um, words that that don't immediately conjure up some sense of somebody being disabled for the rest of their life or of having no control over their life. And I think it's um, partly because of the importance of words and labels that some of the moves to eradicate the stigma of mental illness um, are similar to the moves to eradicate the stigma of being gay or being um, quote unquote obese or being trans. That when people um, claim those words for themselves, you know, when they take ownership of those words and they say, I have autism, they're not letting somebody else define it, right? They're defining it in their own terms. And I don't want to get too, like, you know, teacher-like or academic with you, but I would think that many of your listeners read Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. Or so, saw the movie. <laughs> yeah, 18, uh, whatever, 1850. Um, you know, one of the most famous um, American novels. And it's about this woman, Hester Prynne, who is forced to wear a scarlet letter A on her breast because embroidered uh, scarlet letter A on her breast because she's committed adultery. And she comes back years later. And she's still wearing after exile, she's still wearing the A. And people are saying, why are you still wearing that A? It's been like, you know, a decade, more than a decade. You don't have to keep wearing that. And she says, oh, yes, I do. Because it's not a stigma to me anymore. And she uses the word stigma, or Hawthorne at least does. But she it's, not a, it's not a stigma to me anymore. It's a sign of my endurance and my strength. So she settles back in the village. And then what happens? These neighbors recognize that she understands emotional hardship and they go to her for counsel. That, it's like that letter I, A was like a, an ancient um, uh, a degree in, in clinical psychology. By the way, there was a movie, um, 1995, The Me More. I knew I saw it. My friend Rob Campbell yeah. was in that movie. And oh. I, I don't know if, if in the movie, does, does he write about that part of it in his novel? Well, I haven't seen the movie. 
So I just know the end of the novel is where she comes back. He does own it. So, and then also I noticed that you talk about your own daughter publicly and, and, and talks in your books um, and how she self, I, you always say, you phrase it, she self identifies as autistic. Why? Why do you say that? She, like a lot of parents, you know, we struggled over whether to use that word to try and help her understand why she was having so many challenges why she has so many challenges speaking and having conversations and, and, and having social communication. Um, and when she was maybe in the fifth or sixth grade, we decided to use the word autism and she just latched onto it. And she, she felt that it, it helped to, I mean, she didn't say it helped, but we could under, we could see that it helped her to explain things. If somebody said, why are you talking to yourself? She could say, Oh, I have autism. Somebody said, why this or that? And they even started to ask her things that she uh, that she did well. Like she does crossword, uh, not crossword, um, jigsaw puzzles. And she does really complicated jigsaw puzzles. And she often does them with the picture side down. What? Just the cardboard. Yeah, because she's got great visual spatial skills. And people will say, well, why do you do that? Or how can you do so many complicated puzzles? And she said, oh, because I have autism. You know, and she uses it. I mean, sometimes it's, I can't do the dishes, dad, I have autism. But <laughs> most of the time, it's the way that we think about it. And, and I, I tell the story in the book about her high school graduation. Yeah. When she was asked to give a graduation speech. And she gave the speech and she started off in her, her vocal pattern, her rhythm was unusual. And you could hear, actually the video is up on like a Facebook page somewhere. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. But, but you can, you, you know, I, when I was there, I could sort of hear whispers and murmurs and people kind of chuckling because there were 3,000 people at Constitutional Hall across the street from the White House. And they didn't understand why this person was speaking in this unusual way. And then she says the, the sentence, something like, and kids with autism like me, all of a sudden, the whispering, the murmurs, murmurs of the sounds of stigma, remember, it, they quiet down because they had a framework then to understand her. They had a framework that helped to make sense of something that just a few seconds ago was weird and now made sense. And that's what's happened with this word autism. That's what's happened with words like neurodiversity. It makes sense to us now in a way that it didn't in the past. Although most people don't know the word neurodiversity, much less use it, but most of us do use words like anxiety and depression. I mean, openly and freely that gives me anxiety i struggle with yeah. anxiety or depression around this or around that uh and, and i think that's i feel like that's changed alone in my lifetime um I, you're still getting I emails I still got something i mean i it's shut down but i don't know how to don't even worry about it i'm just gonna mark it and pop it out it's, t- it's totally fine i don't want to lose the track here um so, uh, so so listen uh you know to be frank um, a lot of people that I've talked to in, who are, you know, in the mental health community mm-hmm. are conflicted about the way we're using mental illness terms much more freely today. Oh, interesting. Why? Well, because on the one hand, they think it's a good thing that we talk about it more. But yeah. on the other hand, you know, they don't want it to be trivialized. They don't want somebody to say like Jerry Seinfeld, you know, he says he's autistic. Um, Daryl Hannah says she's autistic. They are not like my daughter. They're not like kids who are nonverbal, who are in, you know, special classrooms and schools and, and have, and sometimes they have, you know, severe epilepsy and um, need lifelong care. So are we trivializing these conditions that can cause great suffering? If I say, you know, oh, I, I had a, a terrible lecture that I just gave. I've got, I will have PTSD from that terrible lecture forever. Right. Right. The PTSD could cause suicide. So do we trivializing it? I actually am of the opinion that we're not trivializing it. Mm-hmm. What we are doing is we're disarming the power of those words and understanding that we are all on a spectrum. And maybe I'm a neat neck. And I say I got a little OCD just because I'm really neat. That can disarm the power 
of OCD to stigmatize somebody who has much more severe symptoms that affect their life. Because we think about OCD as something that isn't just you have it or you don't, but that we have bits of on a spectrum. I, th- I, I would tend to agree with that, but my opinion doesn't really matter on such things. But I, th- I think, I mean, I, I just the way I talk, and I think it's the way that a lot of people talk because of what you're saying in, in both of your anecdotes here now. I think it gives me or another person more likely, because I don't use these words too, too much, uh, for about myself, uh, permission and to, to be comfortable and to continue and further the conversation and potentially a relationship. Yeah. Because it's not something that is supposed to be hidden right. anymore. You can you can talk about it now. I don't want to be a Pollyanna. I know I don't want to say, "Oh, everything's great now." Um, that's not the case. There's a lot of work to do, but I just I just want people to appreciate how far we've come, and you know, and to see that that there are risks that we could move backwards. Well, yeah, and and I think that's great. So let's go back to the uh, the book and talk about you know why all this stuff really matters. And I, I think I have a uh, a good question here about about stigma. You write a lot about stigma. Let's just first talk about the origin. Um, you say that the word stigma actually comes from the ancient Greek word meaning a mark or branding on the body made with a sharp instrument, and it has been associated in the plural form stigmata with Christ's crucifixion wounds. Stigma in our times, however, has come to uh, kind of connote something else. I just wanted to read that because I thought that was, wow, it really goes back. A, yeah. and B, uh, that explains that word stigmata. Uh, but finally, my, my, my question really is, I think it's important as we've been talking, sometimes I'm always conscious of like who's listening and how they're processing it. And I think when we talk about stigma or we talk about anxiety or these things, some people uh, think, listen to these two uh, um, maybe liberal, you know, excusing behavior or, you know, this, this kind of hyper masculinity that we see a lot and people don't want to talk about their feelings, that kind of stuff, especially I think men. But I think more importantly to those people I'm talking now to talk about and learn about stigma is super important because it's not about judgment or acceptance. It's actually potentially, I think, and you write about this, about effective public policy for everybody to benefit. And you go, you go into this, but that's where I wanted to start with stigma. It's not about a feeling or being nice to people. It's about, we can create public policies and and educate people around this so that everybody can function more with more purpose in, in societies as you study your entire life all over the world. Right. When we do it, when we do try to affect policy, we have to do it in a way that actually doesn't exacerbate stigma and that there's, it often backfires. How so? Um, well, don't ask, don't tell. And the whole idea was, oh, there's all this homophobia in the military. Let's, let's make it easier. We'll just say, don't ask, don't tell. Well, it, in effect, though, it kept, it kept things secret. Well, that's could, an awesome, perfect example. But do you have another one? Is it common that we do come up with policies that, in this case, marginalize people and tell them, like, just don't talk about your little problem? Yeah. Uh, one of the whole one entire chapter in my book is devoted to global mental health efforts in Nepal. Okay, a place that suffered lots and lots of tragedy, both from natural disasters, but also uh, a very violent Maoist civil war. And the way in which a lot of the global mental health workers approached um, uh, the the mental health problems in Nepal that were the result of all of this trauma was to say that they, you know, were there to help people with psychiatric problems. But the translation, the way that they talked about emotional distress was in terms of the brain. And it totally frightened people. And nobody was going to go get mental health care if they thought that there was a problem in their brain. And it was only when anthropologists, and here I'm, you know, touting my discipline, Anthropologists came in and they say, well, you know, there are a couple different ways you can talk about the mind. You can talk about the mind in terms of the brain, or you can talk about it in terms of the heart. And when they reframed things to talk about mental illnesses as a problem in your heart, then uh, people opened up. Then they were able to talk more freely about their feelings. Similarly, 
there was somebody who who came in, um, and I write about this in the book, into a very rural area in Nepal, and he kind of set up a, a makeshift mobile medical clinic. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he put a big sign and said, mental health clinic. Nobody came. Then a few months later, he redid this thing, and he put up a sign, and it said, headache clinic. <laughs> and there was a long line. Why? Because a lot of people in Nepal express their psychiatric symptoms through headache. That's how they experience distress. They're not going to say I'm anxious. They're not going to say I'm feeling traumatized by memories. They have a headache. And so you have to find out a way in to make sure that people understand what you're trying to do. There's, you know, global mental health is, it ha- has a lot of problems because it can, it can, it can really backfire, particularly when it focuses on the brain, because um, despite all the neurological and um, neuropsychiatric research that's been done, there is very little evidence that talking about mental illness in terms of the brain has ever decreased stigma. In fact, sometimes it makes it worse because people see the person as damaged. Okay. This is such an important book, and I am nervous as to the time I have with asking the right questions because I, I just want people to go get and read this book because I feel like. As I said earlier, it has liberated something inside me. It has opened up a lot of different avenues for me to explore and think about. I'm really thinking about my family and my friends as I'm reading this book and and other people who I know who, who have who have kids or who are themselves, you know, autistic and so on. And, and it's just so fascinating. But I think I did not expect when I first learned of your work uh, to be thinking about economic systems. The first part of your book it's three parts part one uh, part three is body and mind part two is wars but part one is capitalism and this for me was just the stuff i think about economics a lot i know nothing just to be clear I'm, I, i've never mm-hmm. taken a course in it but i interview smart people and i thought that this was such an important part of the book what what does capitalism have to do with any uh, uh, of your work here well you know, a lot of the attempts to get rid of the stigma of mental illness involve public service announcements and campaigns and education and things like that. But the argument in Nobody's Normal is that we're not going to change stigma unless we can get to the root causes, the fundamental stuff, you know, the foundations of stigma. And one of the foundations of stigma is this idea of the individual that came out of capitalism, that we are each autonomous individuals who are responsible for our own successes and our own failures. And the ideal individual is somebody who's totally in control and takes responsibility and is the master of, you know, his or her um, uh, uh, universe. Destiny, domain, fate, yeah, totally in control of it all. Exactly. And that notion of the individual being separated from a larger community and a network, this ideal of independence as opposed to what all of us know is really the norm, which is we're all dependent on others. We'd be miserable if we weren't dependent in some way on others because we wouldn't have relationships. But that notion of being independent is the thing that has caused just so much harm to people who couldn't do it. Whether you have a physical disability, whether you have an intellectual disability, whether you have a mental illness, that somehow if you're not capable of being this productive worker and maybe leaving home at the arbitrary age of 18 or whatever, now you're an adult, goodbye, that somehow... You're worthless. You're worthless, yeah. Somehow you're impaired. Um, you're a burden. You're a worthless yeah, burden. Yeah, exactly. So I'm seriously just talking to you right now, Richard. I, somebody has to oh, tell you. Telling me I'm worthless. I'm a worthless burden. burden. This book is <laughs> at the pinnacle and it's all downhill. No, I think that's... When I before I started reading the book, I watched your TED talk and I thought this was best illustrated in your TED talk. Maybe you've done many, but the one I watched, you talked about this village that you visited and this they uh, this family had a, had a child who you would clearly diagnose as autistic. And when I watched that TED talk, I kind of was just like, well, first of all, everybody should just go watch. But I, I kind of was like, I just want him to do that. But basically what you learned there from this family was I thought two things that relate to this chapter in, about capitalism is that um, this boy might be considered a worthless burden in in an, in an American community uh, when in fact 
his family said he's not worthless. He's the best kid in, in the village with the sheep. It was goats, but you got, you got it half right. <laughs> Sir, it was sheep. I don't make mistakes. <laughs> I'll tell you what you learned and the goats. But the point being, the, the way I heard that and tell me if I'm on to something is if I'm in a classroom and nobody identifies what I'm good at, I don't think I'm good at anything. And I never I never pursue that. I was talking to my wife about your work here and I said, I bet you there's a whole bunch of composers that would have been geniuses, but no one ever even told them what music was. My wife herself never did any fine art. About five years ago, she got a canvas and she painted this beautiful picture. And I was like, oh, what a waste your childhood. What, like how, how much you lost so much. Have you explore that? If someone would have identified that when you were younger, the point being, we have to identify everybody has some value, including anybody with any kind of impairment. How am I doing so far? You're doing great. I mean, not only is this little boy I talk about, whose name is Geshe, good at herding the goats. He's also great at finding things that people lose. So anybody who loses anything, they call Geshe. They call Geshe, and he finds it for them. Um, the other thing and that is is really important. Sorry to interrupt you, but in that anecdote was, well, you ask him, aren't you worried about what would happen if if you died? You ask Geshe's parents, what did they say? Uh, they said, well, we're, the whole village isn't going to die at once, because the expectation is that there will be people there, and you know that had an impact on me. When I heard that, I came back. I was in Namibia. I came back to the United States. I called up all these cousins just to touch base and mm. kind of renew my relationship with them. Because I, I had realized, you know, someone will take care of Isabel if I'm not here. Because I have a network. But I realized how isolated we'd become as a nuclear family. And so one of the pieces of advice that I have to anybody who's got caring for somebody with a, a serious disability is, you know, make sure you've got a good social support network. And I think, I don't know, I'm sure you've interviewed many, you know, medical professionals on this show, but I think if you ask them what's the most important factor in good outcomes with somebody who's sick in any way or somebody who's disabled in any way, it's, a care team. it's social support. Yeah. Do you have a care team? Do you have right. anybody around you that will will help take care of you? It's not a medicine. Mm. It's not some patented therapy. Mm. Um, it's 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 those those social supports. And so, um, you know, I th I'm not going to idealize um, life in rural Namibia. It's right. crazy tough, but there are things that we can learn. Well, it, it's this idea we, we use all these words. Uh, uh, to describe economic systems and theories. And most people are familiar with those words, but they, they're, they're reactionary to them. They immediately think that's bad or that's good. That's patriotic or whatever it is. Yeah. And it, it's too bad. We just, I, I try to talk about economics without using the words that people are familiar with, like socialism or, or capitalism or anything else, Marx, whatever, even the individual, the community, and just talk about how would you want, what kind of life do you want? What kind of family? What kind of home? And, and how do you get there? What kind of a system? What's fair? What's unfair? And unfortunately, it breaks down pretty quickly. But you you write in detail in, in part one uh, in, in the uh, it's called capitalism, this this first section with four chapters. And so I just want to ask you one more question about it, which is about the invention of mental illness, because I always think it's fascinating to talk to experts yourself about. Um, how closely they align with or support the official classifications and the what's it called the, the DSM manuals and so mm -hmm. on. Like yeah. I, I was surprised to hear some people who I, I respected say, you know, I don't really, I don't know about all that. What, what, what are your thoughts on um, what do you write about in this chapter? And, and, and what are your thoughts on how uh, experts have been identifying mental illness in the last, whatever time frame you want to pick? You know, all of the, language that we use and the concepts that we use, you know, they're, they're all, they were all invented to be useful for some sure. reason, you know, no diagnosis is good if it doesn't drive a treatment, right? So you pick a framework and you say, Oh, this word Asperger's disorder, that's, or Asperger's syndrome. That's a good one to use because we, because autism, when this word was invented in the early nineties, said when the, I mean they took the term from a person named Asperger's said um you know autism is so stigmatized we need a word that isn't going to be so stigmatizing and that can be autistic but somebody who's really smart and speaks really fluently and you know maybe is a computer nerd 
Mm-hmm. And they said, OK, Asperger's is it. And Asperger's did a great job at that because it was this sort of less stigmatizing word. But now that autism is destigmatized, we don't need it anymore. It just did its job. And so Asperger's is gone now. We just talk about autism spectrum disorder. Can we say that Asperger's didn't exist or did exist? It it did exist, but it existed only as a concept or a framework that was useful. It's not like there was some disease in reality that we found and now have eradicated. Um, There are still people with all of the symptoms that were comprised under this word Asperger's, but we just call them something else now. We just call it autism spectrum disorder. And similarly, any time we're talking about human beings, we're we're putting some kind of framework on it. I mean, you just to go back to economics, you know, economics isn't just about production and consumption. It also changes the way we think about ourselves. Medical school textbooks talk about labor and delivery when they refer to childbirth. They talk about menopause as a, a, a ovaries that are in a factory that are in decline. Um, when the people, the, the doctors who thought that masturbation was the worst thing that had, had ever um, happened in the world, um, they phrased that as, you know, throwing your capital out the window. Um, and so, so economics infuses our frameworks too. Even the World Health Organization continues to include in their definition of mental health being a productive individual. By the way, I'm bringing, I'm bringing that phrase back. No one will even know what I was doing. I was just throwing my capital out the window. What does, it say? what does it say about somebody who's a homemaker? You know, a stay-at-home mom, a stay-at-home dad. Are they, are they somehow not healthy because they're not, quote-unquote, productive? It's, what does it say about Van Gogh, who never sold a painting in his life? You, anyway, I, I, I'm beating a dead horse, but it was just oh, yeah. a strange strange um, expression. Phrase, yeah. um, but you also corrected yourself earlier. Uh, you, you said disorder and you corrected uh, syndrome. And I know that you have a, a reason why you don't use the word disorder. Why? Yeah. Um, that's sort of the state of the art now is to say disorder, you know, in the psychiatric community. I don't like it that much because it kind of suggests that we know what an ordered mind looks like. It also suggests that there's something that can be out of order. And when we look at the pejorative terms that people use for mental illnesses, like a screw loose, cracking up, one, what's that other one? One can short of a six pack. It's all about things being out of whack and out of order. I don't like that because I think it actually goes against the goal of eradicating stigma. Right, right. Um, the other thing is that the word illness to me emphasizes more the experience of a person. So somebody who has a cancer, well, that's the disease is cancer. Their illness is what they experience about it. And I'm more interested in the experience of mental illness than I am in this drive to, you know, find the genes that are involved in it and the way in which there might be synaptic or chemical dysregulation in the brain. Because most people, when they are sick, are more concerned with how they feel and what their life is like than what kind of picture shows up in a brain scan. Uh, it's so interesting. Um, part two of your book is I've always been uh, very interested in, in war, the history of war. I've always loved watching films about war, reading books about war. Uh, and in um, and, and, and the last 15 years of my career, in my career, I should say, I've gotten involved in the veterans community a lot. And so I've learned about how war and combat has affected men and women who, who have served or, or even not. Um, and so I was super fascinated, uh, again, that you, you chose to write about this. Uh, part two, wars, the fates of war, finding Freud, war is kind, Norma and Norman. There's a lot to discuss here, but I, I feel like the, 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 the most obvious term that everybody is familiar with at this point is uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I think it used to be called shell shock, right? Well, there was a term shell shock that referred to the emotional consequences of war in men. But the symptoms aren't the same as PTSD. For for one thing, it wasn't P, it wasn't post. You You had shell shock right there you know, in the war theater, um, it didn't appear 
or it shouldn't have affected you three months or four months or a year or 10 years later. The concept of PTSD is different. So I think the point you're trying to make is that war, um, wars have different syndromes and they get defined in terms of the kind of things that are important to people at a particular point in time. And shell shock was this really useful term because uh, what they really meant by it was hysteria. But hysteria was a feminizing term. Hysteria. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hysteria was something that happened to women because it was, you know, hyster- is from the, the word for uterus, hyst- hysteria. Hysteria. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Well, I'm just, yeah. I, I'm really internalizing. My wife just told me to stop being hysterical about something. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a feminizing term uh, yeah. in, the, in World War One. Feminizes me as much as possible. I'm fine with it. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe you could ask her to rephrase that as dramatic or theatrical. She'll be fine anyway. with that. She'll take them. <laughs> Might like probably that. even more accurate. Uh, but yeah. yeah, so so why why did you choose? I, I didn't mention the other two chapters in this section from the Forgotten War to Vietnam, post traumatic stress disorder itself, chapter ten. Um, why do I focus on war? Yeah, yeah. I don't. Why do I focus on war? Because it's this strange thing that when people experience distress in a war, it kind of takes the power away from those mental illnesses to be seen as signs of weakness, because these are people who are in. They're their soldiers. And then who are the people who get uh, mental illnesses in civilian society? The relatives, uh, the people who who lost people in the war, who, who lost property. Um, it's this kind of big universalizing experience. And so, I mean, my grandfather told NBC Radio right after World War II, the stigma of mental illness has finally been eradicated. No, he didn't say that. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm paraphrasing a little, but he said this right at the end of World War II. Uh, kind of premature, right? <laughs> but in each war, we start to see a, a an opening that we have a shot at at uh, at destigmatizing mental illnesses, making them more representative of the human condition. And because we've been in these wars in Afghanistan and Iraq for so long, the U.S. military has focused more on eradicating stigma, I think, than any other part of American society, because of just the length of the wars, the number of people who have suffered. And, you know, you have to be very careful with this, right? You have to be very careful. You don't want to say wars are good. You don't want to say wars do something good. But the reality is that wars are not just aberrations. Whether they're horrible or not, which, and of course, I think they're horrible, they do produce changes and they do build on pre-existing values. Anybody today having surgery is probably benefiting in some way from some kind of anesthesia that was invented. You know, the first um, gender um, affirming surgeries were done by the military because they had men whose genitals had been blown off by bombs and they had to rebuild um, the genitalia. And people who have gender affirming surgery now are directly benefiting from that. Psychiatry benefited, too. After World War II, given the number of soldiers that had mental illnesses, Harry Truman said, hey, we better write a manual. And that, and he, and he, he ordered the military to write the DSM. He ordered the found, founding of the National Institute of Mental Health. All of these things have their origin in the military. And where are we today in 2020, 2021? We have not only on top of these wars... We have another universalizing crisis, which is the pandemic. And if you look at any newspaper on any day, you will find articles about the importance of talking about mental health during the pandemic. It's another universalizing crisis that is giving us a shot at understanding that nobody is normal, that we all inhabit different places on this continuum. Yeah, I have realize that uh, using this phrase, I use this one phrase every day at the end of my show, and I realize it's been very effective um, for me and for everybody listening, which is you're not alone. You're not alone now more than ever. You are not 
alone. And this week, I, uh, it's, it's, it's so cool to be interviewing you. And I interviewed this week, Dr. James Gordon, who's just written a book. Oh, uh, fellow DC. Uh, I think he's yeah, in DC. I, too, yeah. I, I literally looked up both their names. I tried to Google both their names. I'm like, I wonder if these guys have ever been in the same room and a, a symposium or know each other because they, they could play off each other's work a great deal. But um, I think also when, when talking about war, I don't know if, if you get into addiction here, but it is really interesting to see uh, how war affects you come back, you do drugs, you come back, uh, you're fighting addiction and, and they're using all kinds of different uh, solutions to fight opiate addiction. Most people that are addicted to opiates had nothing to do, started them nothing to do with war, probably painkillers. But uh, there's a real overlap, I think, with veterans and just, you know, uh, folks that are struggling or that you know, get, get addicted to heroin or opiates, et cetera. And it's very interesting to find the solutions apply to kind of two separate populations uh, in a good way. I don't know if that's um, something that you, you speak to, if that's in your world of anthropology, but I thought that was interesting to bring up in the war section. Well, it's certainly um, relevant. I don't go into great detail um, in terms of substance abuse, but it is certainly one of the more um stigmatized of conditions because it actually goes against those early foundations of self-control and the individual being autonomous and in control. Because when, when you have an addiction, there is this sense that you're not in control, that the disease controls you and you don't have control. And that, and that adds to the dilemma of seeking care. And so as with many mental illnesses, when we when we think about them or when we see somebody who we believe has a particular illness, we don't immediately go to the social context. You know, we think about them as individuals because that's the legacy of our economic and political history. When we see somebody who's experiencing homelessness, our first thought is, oh, this person must be addicted to something or must have a mental illness or must be a psychotic rather than. What are the factors that might have led somebody who had a mental illness to actually be experiencing a homelessness? When we see the kid in cl the classroom who's not performing the same way as the other kids, we say, oh, what's wrong with this kid? And not, is it possible that this kid is actually really good at some things but hasn't had the opportunity to do it? Is it possible that the way in which we organize our classrooms isn't ideal for many children? We, we we have to step back a minute, you know, and and think about um, what the social conditions are that that lead to certain things. And this, of course, leads me to another problem of global public global mental health. And please cut me off if you need to for time. But, you know, when people go to Nepal or they go to some other place that has had extraordinary tragedy and poverty and they say, oh, they have depression or they have schizophrenia or they have PTSD. Again, they're trying to isolate the disease inside the person rather than say maybe war, conflict, poverty. These things lead to mental well, illness. You're differentiating there and obviously in your book and all of your work, the difference between you and your your father, your grandfather, your great grandfather in psychiatry and anthropology. That's what you're doing there. You're you're you're, you're offering that solutions are uh, problems are society based, not individual based often. And the and so the solutions are also society based, not exactly treating the the individual which leads us to to part three of your amazing book nobody's normal uh body and mind what's the best question to ask you for part three sir can you just cheat and do my work for me what do you um, want to say about this oh, final okay, second okay so the so the best you're you know anthropologists we do this all the time we don't want to lead the witness you know so we say you give me a question well i i, I well that's that's how academics do it. I'm just a stupid uh, <laughs> podcast host and comedian, and I didn't get to part three of your book. <laughs> that's why I don't have the. Best oh, question. that's it. Okay. I'm not there yet. That's why I've, I've right, been right. prepping a lot, but I'm I'm not there yet, and I think it's probably you well, know it's so important. So I want I basically want to make sure that we get to the kind of the impo most important. Okay, every because, part important you book. can say, Richard, you know, why is it so important for us to understand how we've historically made a distinction between the body and mind. What does that have to do with stigma? Well, I like that question. Could you answer it for me? For yourself? Yeah. Um, what does it have to do with stigma? Is that so many 
of the symptoms that we have that are psychiatric, that are emotional distress, um, we experience and we can experience them physically, right? From the little things like butterflies in your stomach or getting a little flushed when you're embarrassed or even imagining a scenario in which you'll be embarrassed. You can, can I give you mine? What'd you say? Can I give you mine? Oh, uh, sure. I suffered, dealt with, I, I'll call it anxiety and depression for the first time in my life, severe, uh, uh, last year when I lost my corporate media job. And I was so broken for the first time in my life. First time, really, just t- always the optimist, always helping other people, always mentoring other people, uh, um, continuing to grow and be successful. All of a sudden, there I am with, in this case, a professional issue, a financial issue, an ego issue, all of it broken, no idea what to do. And my wife led me out of it because she has all, so and so did my community of, of, of folks listening here, which is why I'm back doing this podcast and doing great. But my body, Richard, vibrated. It sh- I was shaking. So I went to, for the first time, see doctors in years. And everybody said the same thing. Of course. I mean, I thought I had super Parkinson's MS AIDS. I was convinced of it. Of course, I had it all. And I went to a what is a neurologist, I guess, did a bunch of tests. He's like, um, you lost your job. You're experiencing anxiety. That's why you're shaking. And uh, I'm I'm sorry you had that experience, but it sounds like I'm not. It was horrible. I hope I never go back there. But right. as a lot of people said, you are you are learning coping skills. You you know, this is something that you're learning resilience. Life doesn't necessarily get easier as you age. So you better you better well, prepare yourself so you're not so fragile. I, I you know, I think most primary care physicians and certainly neurologists will tell you that, you know, a, a majority or close to it of the patients that come in to see them are experiencing symptoms that aren't necessarily is that right? going to do some specific medical finding like a bacterium, you know. Or a, bi- a virus, you know. Think about all the things that that can be psychiatric: um, headache, numb, feeling numbness in your fingers, um, diarrhea, skin rashes. Sometimes um, gastroenterologists refer to the test- intestines as a second brain, so because you can have all kinds of stomach ailments. Before and any the performance, problem is yeah. that if you say to somebody who needs psychiatric care, oh. I think you could benefit by seeing a psychiatrist for this involuntary muscle movement or this um, intractable diarrhea. They say, what do you think? I'm pretending to be sick. Right. They're not pretending to be sick. They are sick. Those are the symptoms. And basically, we experience our distress in ways that are the most culturally acceptable. And it is more culturally acceptable to be to have a headache and fatigue than to say, I feel terrible about myself and I'm so anxious. I, I guess you didn't get to this, this chapter, but there's a, there's a chapter in Nobody's Normal about penis theft and the epidemic of penis theft in Central Africa and also in West Africa. And your listeners can't see the, the, the um, face you're making, but... Um, this is yeah. the face I make when I'm trying not to speak, that's all. <laughs> okay. Hold me back, sir, so please. <laughs> all right. And so you look at that and you go, oh, that's crazy. How could people say that their penises have been stolen? And throughout Africa, there has been an epidemic wave of penis thefts. Now, are people actually stealing penises? Are they stealing them and making medicine with them or whatever? Um, The doctors will often examine people who say that they've experienced penis theft and they still find an intact, apparently functional organ there. So where is this belief coming from? It is a supernatural belief that is grounded in the fact that increasingly people in um, sub-Saharan Africa are living in more diverse, socially complex um, communities. They're interacting with strangers more. They are um, in, in cities and they are afraid and they're anxious about their ability to reproduce their community. They're anxious about their um, ability to uh, remain safe in society, given all of the complexity. Mm -hmm. And so the the genital that is stolen becomes the symbol for having your identity stolen, your man, the most important thing to you. And when somebody screams in a crowded marketplace, my penis has been stolen, 
people don't say that person is crazy. They say, that, may, that makes sense. It makes sense. Freud called this the sense of symptoms. And so when shell shock victims in World War I had traumatic disorder, they experienced problems with balance and gait. Those are what people thought were the result of having been near shells. But most of the people who had shell shock had never even been to combat. And then in World War II, when it became more acceptable to talk about our feelings and talk about anxiety and depression and things like that, people started to have fewer of those physical symptoms and more of the emotional ones. So I use the example from Africa as an extreme case yeah. to say that it is society that yep. tells us what is an acceptable or an unacceptable way to represent, experience, convey our distress. I think that's just such the value of your, your, your entire career, your work, your scholarship is that you, you basically go to other cultures all over the world and see how they perceive and treat all of these issues, psychiatric issues that we're talking about. And I think that's so interesting. I never thought about that. I guess I did think about it and you, you address this when a young friend of mine, a former intern of mine who is uh, Indian American, first generation. And he talked about in his community who are uh, actually Christians. If I don't think that matters to the point. Um, but like if somebody has a, a child with any kind of developmental disability, they hide them. It's total shame. And I don't mean to generalize about the Indian American uh, Christian community or, or, or anybody else, but you talk about this, how cultures perceive any kind of developmental disability as frankly, an embarrassment, a shame. You also talk about it, how it uh, relates to just general socioeconomics. Wealthy people can't have um, issues with their children because that makes them, you know, uh, I guess right. not to, I don't want to uh, reference any, any, any famous people who have kids with, uh, with any kind of issues, but we know, you know, these types of people that we're talking about, how does, how does that relate? How, why is that so important? I guess I would just answer your question by saying that all over the world, there are still people who are in prisons, who are in shackles, who are in, you know, tied up and treated horribly. Or if they're not treated horribly, they're shielded and hidden and kept away from 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 others. We really do have a lot of work to do. The largest supplier of mental health care in the United States is the U.S. prison system. We need to to do better. But what I guess I'm trying to say in this book is that things are changing and sometimes they can change really fast. Like I've done a lot of work in South Korea. Mm -hmm. And when I started working there in the end of like 2005, 2007 on autism, um, people just wouldn't talk about it. It was just so incredibly secretive and shameful. And it reflected bad. it, It meant you were a bad parent if you had a kid. Well, oh, that's so horrible. And even further, it meant you had bad genes in your family. Right. That's what I was trying to articulate earlier. Yeah. 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 So, and then if I can plug a TV, Korean TV show, um, you know, it has all the negative things that Korean soap operas have too, but it's, it's this show. It's much better in translation in English. The, the English translation is it's okay not to be okay. Oh, wow. And the Korean, if you translate it exactly is, She's psycho, but that's okay. <laughs> it's not, not the best title. The English one is much better. But this is a, 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 a miniseries that's on Netflix that um, it's okay not to be okay. And it's, it's about how wonderful a person with autism is. And as you begin this drama, you see that there's this uh, younger brother who's got to take care of his older brother because their parents are dead. And his older brother has autism and the younger brother takes care of the older brother. But by the end of the movie or the end of the miniseries, you don't know who's taking care of whom because they're taking care of each other. And you see tremendous growth in this older man who has autism and you see tremendous empathy and sympathy for him and appreciation of both what his challenges are, but what his strengths are. And this is in a decade. This is in a matter of a decade. Many people say, you know, South Koreans do things fast, but this is really, really wow. fast. Uh, that's a great example. This book is so good. I've taken up enough of your time. We've talked for an hour and oh boy, it's just fascinating. And well, so you're, you're an easy uh, person to talk to. So. Well, I'm glad you said that. I was really nervous because this is such an important book. I really wanted to make sure we got out, you know, as much of it as we, as we could here. 
And uh, it was a great conversation. Nobody's normal. How culture created the stigma of mental illness. When I'm done with it, I hope we can talk again or any other time because it's it's really important for people to hear about the work you're doing here. Yeah, and absolutely. Really, I really appreciate your enthusiasm. Awesome. Thank you so much, sir. Take care. Okay, that is it. That's my conversation for today. Nobody's Normal is the book, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. And like I said, I'm really enjoying the book and hope to have him back. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that and anything else. And would love your support by becoming a paid subscriber. If you haven't already, over 800 people have signed up to support me and so many other people are asking me, hey, how are you doing that? How are you able to make that happen? Well, folks, it's 14 years of talking to experts and gaining their trust and learning how to do a decent interview and learning how to be self-critical and always trying to make it better and a lot of hard work. Hey, how about it? Thanks for your support. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic right now or go to the paid subscription link in the show notes. Hope to see you Thursday night at 8 for a hangout. Did I say 8? I'm not sure of the time yet. I'll uh, I'll let you know if you're a subscriber. You'll get the link mailed to you as you do every day. There's an email that pops in your box. Every day we open with vitamin N, a photo from a listener from somewhere around the world of nature. I throw it in every morning. Just another reason to open that email up if you haven't already. Check it out. If you're a subscriber and you're not getting an email, check your settings. Thank you for your support. Thanks for listening to today and I will talk to you right here tomorrow on Stand Up. Tell your friends. I love you. You're not alone. That's the time you gotta finally get up on where you need. When you can't see the forest for the burning trees, you got to stand up. Hey, you've been sitting so long, you got the creaky knees, you got to stand up. Stand up.